going to go through today is probably one of the most exciting topics I've talked about in a very long time, because what we're going to go through and think about is how we can think differently about full arch restorations today, full arch implant restorations. Now, why do I want us to think differently about these things? It's because the reality is we've thought about doing these things the same and have been doing them the same way for an extremely long time. We've all, all followed this exact same pattern. We've started off with a conventional impression. We get that. Either we pour it up or we send it to the lab to make us a soft tissue model. From there, we get a verification jig. We try in the verification jig. We send that back. We get a bar made. We try that in for passivity, make sure that fits. At that point, we can do something to kind of go ahead and get the bite registration, try in our, our prosthesis and wax, and then we finally move to our final prosthesis. And you know, some of these times, these cases can take visit after visit after visit to where we're doing just a million different visits to try to accomplish getting a full arch prosthesis. Now, why I want us to think a little bit differently about this is to really look at the technology which is out there and really see how we can leverage this technology to do things very different from a full arch perspective. This all begins with the prime scan. Okay, with the dense supply Serona Prime Scan and its new 5.2 software, because this thing has really changed the way that we're able to scan these things and go ahead and get the data in a very different way in which we have in years past. The other thing which we're going to leverage is there's a brand new authorized scan body for the multi unit, the Smart Fix abutments. And what this does is it goes directly onto the abutment and we can go ahead and scan that and build things off of there. In the cases I'm going to show you today, I'm not doing any try-ins. I'm not doing any convert. I'm not doing any uh, verification jigs. There's going to be no models used in any of this. I'm going to do things very differently because I think a lot of the times we end up duplicating our work because we have so much information already in our conversion prosthesis, and we're going to use that in a digital way to be able to go ahead and plan our cases and figure out where things need to go. And all this is made possible through this new concept and this new product called the Lannis Bridge Base. And what this is, is this is the, an ability to form a bar completely in a digital fashion. And then from that bar, what we're able to do is we're able to use that bar in a core file form, which is what you see here, and build all the prosthetics that go on top of that form in a completely digital fashion before we've actually even received the bar in the instances with both of the cases I'm going to show you today. And we can do this all completely modelless in ways in which we've never been able to do before. And with this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at using that Atlantis bridge base in three very different workflows. And I'm going to go through and kind of explain these different workflows to you now. So it all begins with the core file. And from the core file, up the bar, what we're able to do and what we're going to do on our very first case is we're going to kind of do the conventional metal acrylic pathway, which we've always done, except put a new and digital twist on these things. So we're going to start off with the actual milled bar that we see here. From there, we're able to go ahead and print out some gums. We can do this from our carbon printer with our Lucitone print. And then from there, we're going to go ahead and use just standard carded teeth in this particular venture. Now, this is what we've kind of always been used to and, you know, processing it out, doing it all this way, except we're putting this new kind of digital twist on it and doing it in a very different way. Now, the other two workflows we're going to do is we're going to do this on one patient and do both of these so we can kind of look at both of them. And again, this basis of this all begins with this core file from the Atlantis Bridge Base. And with this one, we're going to go ahead and make the bar and we're going to go a more modular monolithic approach where we're either going to do something like this where we're printing out the gums. And in this time, instead of doing individualized carded teeth, what we're going to do with it is go ahead and mill or print a whole section of teeth and put that together. Or we go the fully monolithic, which we're going to do zirconia over the bar and go that right, that, that route. And so you can do either which one of these three pathways, and it just depends on what you want to do. And we're going to look at all three of them in two different patients. Now, the two patients are coming in with two extremely different rationales and reasons for treatment. And so we're going to look at why we're treating them and go through very in depth all the ways that we can go ahead and work these patients up and do these patients from the completely digital restorative workflow pathway. 
All right, so let's begin with our first pet presentation. Our patient presents to us like this. And again, on first blush, we can't really see too much of what the problem is. You can, if you look real closely, you can start to see some teeth are kind of in some places where we really wouldn't want them. And it isn't until we get the patient retracted in the mouth and especially look at the lateral views that we can see some of the complicating factors of this case. She's coming in because COVID's kind of, you know, at this point, this was about six months to a year ago when we started this case. And the reality is she's coming in just because in her words, she just can't take it anymore. She's lived this way her whole life with the teeth in, the, in these positions. And just aesthetically, from her confidence perspective, she's finally just coming in because masks are coming off. And she says, I just can't keep dealing with this. She's in her early to mid 60s and just says, I've dealt with this my whole life. I just want to be able to smile. I just want to be able to not have people look at me weird and anything like that. And I'm just willing to do literally whatever I can to get my mouth taken care of. And when I'm looking at her originally, you know, I start talking with, with a couple different people and we first start thinking of some orthognathics, you know, orthodontic type routes and different things like that to really try to move the bone and move the teeth and whatnot. And when we kind of started looking at this, the reality is a lot of the teeth were actually in some pretty bad shape. She had a, some decay, well, quite a bit of decay. She had some perio issues down below. And what we decided upon was just that route would not be the greatest route for her. And we decided we were just going to take out both arches of teeth and be able to then from a full implant solution, move things where we wanted them. So that was the plan. So we first started off just taking out the lower arch. I took out the lower arch, went ahead and put the implant guide on, used the Astrotech EV guided system to place the implants. From there, put on the smart fix abutments and did a conversion prosthesis like we see here. And then on the upper arch, what we did is went ahead and looked at four different teeth that weren't in the way of where we wanted to place implants initially. Took out all the other teeth and put her in a printed provisional on those four teeth while we bone grafted everything else. Now she functioned in that for a few months. And when we looked at how much bone we were able to get from that grafting, it was noted that we would actually need more bone. And so what was decided upon was to take out those other four teeth so we could graft it again graft it again and put her in just a quick and easy kind of immediate printed denture, okay? So at this point, she's healed on the top, the lower arch is fully healed, and we're ready to take her to some more definitive type restorations. Now, how are we going to do this, okay? This is, a, this is the workflow which we're going to use on the cases you're going to see today and all the cases that I that I actually do my full arch with, I do this way in this digital format. And it's a pretty simple workflow. What you start off with is you always want to start off scanning the opposing arch. From scanning the opposing arch, you want to then move up to your, your seated temporary prosthesis or your conversion prosthesis. From there, scan the bite. It's pretty simple. This is what we do on pretty much every case that we scan. The difference here is that the foreScan, we're going to go ahead and scan the soft tissue and the heads of the multi-unit abutment so we can make sure we're getting the tissue there and see where the tops of the multis are. And then the final thing is we're going to put on the brand new scan bodies and go ahead and scan those. Now, how you set this up, again, if you're using the prime scan, and that's what we use on, on these because we're really trying to get the most accuracy and fidelity we can with this, and it all lines up perfectly in the software to be able to work with your lab and send to Atlantis to create these things. This is really how you'd set it up. There are a couple little nuances with this though. First thing first is whatever your treatment arch is, that's where you're going to actually scan your temporary prosthesis. You're not gonna do kind of in this particular workflow, something like a biocopy or something of that nature, because then all your bites aren't going to line up correctly. So you want to go ahead and put your temporary in as your working jaw, your treatment jaw, like you see here. The other thing which you need to do is you'd need to add just the catalog for gingival mask lower, okay? And all this is set up in the prime scan in the connect software and under scan bodies, you just go down and find the one for the smart fix abutments and it's the multi-unit abutment kind of option on there. And from there, click that and that will set up everything except for that gingival mask catalog. So that's how we go ahead and put it all into the software. Now, first things first on her is, again, that upper denture has quite a bit that can be desired on this. So the first thing we're going to start off with is making sure that that intaglio fit, fits very well. Go ahead and just take a standard wash on this. 
This is commonly called a reference denture. We can go ahead and scan that reference denture. Go ahead and put it, you know, hold it with your hand, with your prime scan. Go ahead and scan it. We're going to scan both the cameo and the intaglio surface so we can get all of the landmarks, all of the tissue bearing areas, everything that we need to be able to get a very, very solid scan and digital impression of this area. Now with this, I like to kind of use this term instead of reference denture. I also like to use this as, as what I like to call a digital bite rib whether it's this, whether it's a lower conversion prosthesis, because what this is going to do for you is this will allow you to know exactly where the teeth are and then make any changes you want relative to those things, just like you would in a bite rim. And so we're going to use all the information that the patient comes here with and move in that direction so that we can use this as a reference for every step moving forward. <clears throat> now, one question I get very frequently is, People say, well, sometimes scanning dentures is hard. And I'll be honest, sometimes it is. I've been very, <clears throat> I've been very happy with the 5.2 software because it's scanning dentures better than we've ever been able to scan things on the prime scan before. But this is the question I get very frequently with people is, is there one way better to scan a denture than another? You know, do we just scan it like the denture on our left? Do we put on some spray so we can kind of coat it so it's got something different with it? we go ahead and get a marker and mark it all up so that we can see things that way? Do any of them work better than one another? And in my, in my experience of doing these things, what I've noticed is, to be honest, really none of them work better than another. It's just the biggest thing with it is making sure when you are scanning these things that you scan very diligently as you go around and making sure you have very good overlap as you go through, especially the cameo surface because on that palatal part, that can be the part where we have the biggest problems because it's really smooth, it's really reflective, and we can sometimes have issues with that. So we just need to make sure as you're going through with all your passes to scan these things, that you're overlapping things well, and that way you're able to get the best scan. And the interesting thing is this Dobda paper from 2017 showed that of all the ways we can actually duplicate a denture, the best way is to hold it in your hand, scan it, and move forward that way. That's why we go ahead and do that. So again, that's the first thing we do is scan the opposing arch, which in this instance is the upper jaw. Now we're going to go down to the conversion prosthesis on the lower jaw. At this point, again, you're going to just want to scan this. Again, this is going to act like our digital bite rim. That way we can make any changes we want relative to this. Now, we're going to look at a scan pattern here in the moment, but the first thing you want to do with these scans is you always want to make sure you're getting the teeth to the best of your ability, because that's what we want to build the model off of. So we want the model be, to be set from good data, which is what our teeth gives. Once we get the teeth, then we're going to go down to the tissue and start trying to capture the tissue. And if you notice this, my tissue keeps coming in and then coming out and then coming in and coming out. Well, just persevere in these areas, because sometimes the the software isn't realizing you want these things. And sometimes it can take some time for it to realize that, yes, you do in fact need that, then it will go ahead and stitch everything together. Now, when you scan these things, the most important thing that you want to do and the most important data that you want to get from these is you want to make sure you get the facial tissue, that good keratinized tissue, and back up to the retromolar pad areas. Because what this will do is this gives you landmarks so that every scan that you have moving forward, you can stitch it to these areas and get everything to line up very well. Also, if we're questioning where our, our occlusal plane and whatnot is, that's why being able to get up to the retromolar pad areas is also valuable. So that way we can go ahead and evaluate where our occlusal plane needs to be if we have any questions for it. Now, why in the world do we start scanning this and not just jump right down and take everything off and scan with just the tissue and the scan bodies. Well, the reason being is because what we have seen in our research is that the most accurate thing that we can scan is, we can, is teeth, okay, is a full arch of teeth. And what we've seen in our papers from 2019 and 2020, and especially this comes from our 2020 paper, is that when we go ahead and scan an arch like this, where it's got good landmarks like teeth, with the prime scan, we can get the cross arch accuracy of these things to be down to about 18 microns, 
which is absolutely astounding. And again, this was from 2020. So we did the data at the end of 2019 and start of 2020. What we've seen now in 2021 is as, we've scanning, as we're scanning with these things, we're actually clocking down to about the nine to 10 micron range, which is just absolutely astounding for cross arch accuracy. But that's why we wanna start off scanning teeth first is because it sets our model with the most accurate thing that you possibly can scan. Now, the final thing that we're going to scan with both sets of prostheses in there is the occlusion. And again, scan in CR, scan in whatever it is that you like to scan in or you want to build the patient in, go ahead and scan that patient like this. And the great thing that this is going to do for you is because we've set it up this way, is all the models will come in at this exact same vertical, at this exact same occlusion, and so everything will be cross arch mounted in that exact same area. That's the greatest thing. I, I think of if there's no other benefit whatsoever than that, I think that is absolutely a huge, huge, huge thing for us that makes our lab partners' lives way easier. Now, now is when we start getting into the fun of these things. So we're gonna take off the prosthesis, expose the heads of the multi-units and the tissue like you see here, and this is what we're going to scan. So we go ahead and have the patient sit as still as humanly possible. And I'm deliberately starting off our cases here showing the lower arch because I get asked this a lot. People saying, well, you can do the upper, but you can't do the lower. Well, I'm here to show you, you can actually do the lower. Now the lower is more difficult than an upper is, but the reality is you can do this. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to go ahead and get those heads of the multi-units very well and we're also trying to get all that same tissue that we had and get up again, if we can, a little ways up into the retromolar pad area. Now, with this, you want to make sure you're getting the exact same landmarks because those same landmarks will allow you to go ahead and merge this scan with the other scan. Now, most of the time, the computer's gonna do it itself and bring it in for you. But if it doesn't, as long as you've got those same landmarks, you can just poke the same areas on each one. And as you do that, it will go ahead and register those two things together. Now, one little word of caution. Like I say, I'm starting with the lower arch just because this is the question I get from most people is, can you do the lower arch? But the reality is this is not where you want to start your very first case that you're ever scanning for a full arch hybrid is the lower arch, okay? It's the harder one of them all. So I'd say with patients, just start on the upper arch, okay? Your first case, get a patient like this. This is a different patient of mine. And again, you can see this scan as we go through, and I've got an Optrigate in there to kind of pull the lips and cheeks and everything out of the way. This scan is super easy to do on the upper arch. It took me a whopping 33 seconds to do this scan is all. And if you actually look at the total scan time on this, on this entire case right here, this one, it took only three minutes and 45 seconds to do all those scans that we needed. But that's where you're gonna start is something like that because you have a lot of good tissue, you've got a lot of good landmarks, and this is significantly easier to do than the lower arch. Now, compare and contrast that to literally the hardest case I have ever scanned in 16 years of owning a scanner. It was this one right here. This, this is sped up to 10x speed. And the reason why it's sped up to 10x speed is because I had to scan her for, I think it was 26 freaking minutes to be able to get a scan, okay? And again, the hard part about her, she had absolutely no vestibule. The floor of the mouth came up and over the ridge just at rest. She had nothing on the facial and it was an absolute and utter nightmare. That is not where you want to start learning these cases and doing these cases from a digital perspective are things like that. So I think especially when people are first getting into this, you need to be able to have some good case selection so that you're choosing the right cases so you can have success right out of the gate, okay? Now, the final thing which we're going to do on this is we're going to go ahead and scan the scan bodies. Now with the scan bodies, what we do is this, you put the scan bodies in, and go ahead and go all the way around these things. And the whole object of this is to go ahead and create something that looks very clean and very nice like we see here. We're trying to get the architecture perfect of those scan bodies, okay? 
that's the main thing along with the tissue in those areas so that we can go ahead and pin the models together. Now, I get this question a lot. Well, what if we just start off with this? You know, we did nothing else. What's the accuracy of that? Well, we looked at this in a paper that we just published a couple months ago. Again, cross arch accuracy with the prime scan, even on this, where you just have tissue and scan bodies, is 43 microns, which is pretty astounding just for that. But then the question always is, well, is that good enough? And the reality is, I'll be frank, we don't really know. Because when you look at things, about the only good data there is out there is this Yoxted paper, which showed that even at 100 microns of misfit, you still maintain passivity when the bars went in. And it wasn't until you got into the tune of about 140, 150, 160, all the way up to 230 microns, which is when you started having some problems with misfit, but they showed that there was no deleterious consequences to the actual patient itself. So do I think it's good enough? I really do. I think we're there. Now, one of these things that if you see what we've really started to hone in and look at this is with a lot of our patients, we're scanning them in multiple different ways with different scanners, with lab scanners, different things like that. And what we've seen when we look at the lab scanner here in the, in the blue versus the prime scan in the yellow, what we see is again, this is a patient in the mouth. The accuracy is pretty much the same, 27 microns for the prime scan in the mouth, 25 for the lab scanner. And the interesting thing is, We've got two different prime scan scans here, and there's a difference between the two. And again, one's significantly more accurate than the other. And what it has to do is it has to do with scan pattern. So if you're going to scan these things, you need to get the data in the proper way that the, that the scanner wants it to be able to build these things. And this is generally what we see is, again, these are the two pathways which we've found to work the best for these things. And again, I put them both up on here because sometimes you may need to scan the patient a little bit differently. So it's good to know the two ways in which to get the data into your prime scan in the most accurate way. Now, this right here, this is it. This is the most important part is everything comes in absolutely cross arch mounted. Everything's the same. Everything's at that same vertical. And again, if you don't feel comfortable going the full digital pathway, go ahead and just do this and then snap a conventional impression. Now I didn't on this patient, but you can always snap a conventional impression, have your lab pour it up and bring it in. Okay. Now let's look at a couple of things with 5.2 software that, that may look a little bit different that actually help us out here. If you look at it and we're looking, especially in the lingual portions, you start to see some things that generally you don't see on some scans and I'll just highlight them. Okay. Let's look at lingual and you see these two areas here. And what you're seeing is you're seeing holes here. Now with those holes, with 5.2 software, what it does is it doesn't extrapolate the data and fill in those holes. So if you have a spot where, where you're missing data between my two hands, it's not going to fill those in. And the reason being is because we don't want that data filled in because if you fill that data wrong, it really can change the whole architecture of the scan body. And the best way I've been able to figure this out to help you guys understand this is this. I want your brain to fill in the missing data here. Now, what did you think of with it? There's a lot of different ways which we can fill in the data. We could, it could be pump, lump, dump, rump, jump. And it can dramatically change the outcome just by changing that little bit of the data. And it's the same thing that we see here with scanning and scan bodies. When you look at this particular scan, if you look at that scan body that's right here closest to us, you can see the top of its arc. Okay, and it's because it was missing a little bit of data. So the scan, so the algorithm of this particular scanner, which is a different one, moved things and melted things. You look at the base there of that other one, it pulled it in. You look at the top, it tucked that in a little bit. And this is all due to the algorithms extrapolating the data and trying to figure out what needs to go where. And the problem with that is, is what you have to do is as you move on to step, the next steps, when it goes to the lab, there's this idealized analog right there that we have to marry those two things together. And if we have all this extrapolated data, as we go to merge those things together, we can get a mismatch of the merge because that cylinder isn't absolutely true. So that's why with 5.2, it doesn't extrapolate that data so that we can maintain the absolute fidelity that you see there. Because what it does for us is once it's merged, that's where your analogs come from. That's where your screw holes come from. That's where all the positions that are needed to be able to build these things come from. And what we've seen with this scan, even with that missing data, we still had a 97% merge alignment with these things. And thus we were able to get something that fits extremely well in there. 
Now, from there, we're able to build the bar completely digital. And what we're able to then do is we're able to take it, build it in a completely digital nature, even before we get the bar. And in this particular route, we're going with more of a modular approach where we're getting the bar, we're printing the gums, we're putting the car to teeth in. And what happens is these two pieces will then come together, we'll glue them together, and bond them before we go ahead and go to the mouth. Then it's all about finishing things and now it's ready to go. The upper is kind of built in a very similar way from a denture perspective. We go ahead and design the teeth and the gums. We go ahead and print out, print out the gums, put carded teeth in, finish everything. And now it comes back to me. I'll go ahead and put it in the mouth and we can see the PIP is fitting really well. When we look at the clinical fit, again, very nice retention. She's got some great retention from there. It's not coming out, even though she didn't love me pulling on her face to show this. And then from that perspective, we put everything together and you can see right where we're at. Okay, midlines are on, occlusal plane is on. When we look at the lateral view, the bites are on exactly where we want it. When I put these things on, it was a very passive fit. And I think what everybody really wants to see is this, when we look at the fit of these things, it's an absolutely outstanding fit. And again, this is what we want to achieve. And you have to realize that all of these changes were done in basically you had the one restorative visit and here's the delivery in a completely digital, completely modelless approach. Now, let's look at one more patient to kind of end our day. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at patient number two. And this patient, while we were all enjoying this nice Christmas celebration, she was having a very, very different time. It's because the reality is you can start to see if you look closely what kind of her problems were. Christmas day, what happened is she was biting. It's actually Christmas morning, blew out her front two teeth. And unfortunately, because it was Christmas time, it took her about four to five days to find somebody that could put her back together. But that wasn't the only problem she had. That year, she also blew that tooth out and blew this tooth out. And so she had three massive, massive problems just within that year. And the year prior to that, apparently she'd also blown out all six teeth and then blown out a canine separately from that as well. So she had all these problems. And this is one of the things that we see with conventionally built metal acrylic hybrids is you know, from this wonderful paper from 2012, you see that at 10 years, you only have about a 9% chance of being complication free. And that's actually why she's coming in to see me is because she got this built elsewhere. And she's saying, I just can't even, I, 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 have, I can't even fathom biting into anything. She's like, I haven't bitten any, into anything from Christmas because I'm too scared of like, are there any other solutions out there? And so for her, we're going to go a very different approach. We're going to go of a more modular monolithic or a complete monolithic approach on her because we don't want anything to pop out. Now, when we look at her from her initial perspective, we can see, again, we're going to use this as our digital bite rim and move things where we need to be. Seven and eight are kicked out a little bit. We're gonna change the aesthetics. We're gonna move everything down and over just a little bit as well. And we can see you know, from the staining, the repairs that have been done over and over and over on her prostheses. Now, with the Atlantis bridge base, again, we're going to use that as our base. And then from there, we're going to use that bar to either go a fully monolithic approach with zirconia or the modular monolithic approach where we've got the printed gums and the, and the mill teeth. Now, same exact workflows before, but let me show you a couple little nuances. The first thing is when you scan the opposing arch, go ahead and have the patient go tap, 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 tap because you wanna scan it with the articulating paper. That way you can verify the bite before the patient even leaves with the heat map, which is what we see here, okay? This I think is one of the greatest things because we've always just sent things to lab, you know, with sometimes a couple bites so they can make sure that they're all set. Well, now we can verify the bite is, is right before the patient actually leaves our chair. Second thing is if we're scanning the upper arch this time, the important areas are similar spots, okay? We want the tuberosity regions, we want the palatal because we've got a lot of great tissue that can be there. And then from the side, when you go ahead and scan that buccal vestibule, put your scanner in there and have the patient close because when they close down a little bit, then that gives you a little bit more space so that you can easily get in and scan those areas. Now, at this point, we get all this data together. This is all going to go down to the lab, get sent over to him, and everything again is going to be cross arch mounted exactly where we want with a verified bite. Now, the first thing we're gonna show is this modular monolithic approach. And what we are doing with this one is using our pre-op teeth, like we see there, moving things over to where we want it and building the printed 
printed gums and milled teeth over the top. So we've got the printed base, we've got the milled teeth, put those together, go ahead and finish the case. And then the other one we're going to do is in a similar fashion, we're going to go with the monolithic zirconia, which you see here. And again, this is where the lab gets very artistic. This one's by Jack Murano, and he did a wonderful job of characterizing the zirconia, going ahead and putting the porcelain, the pink porcelains over the top and making an absolutely beautiful prosthesis. And I think right here, this is kind of the most important part is he's built all these things before he's even got the bar. So he gets the bar, opens everything up, takes this out, and you can see that clink is the best sound. It just goes in and seats perfectly there, completely passive. This wasn't adjusted or anything before, you know, he put these in. And again, it fits very well in the other one as well, because we've got two different bars made. They're the same bar just put in so we could show you these two different solutions. And at that point, he fuses them all, finishes them all, sends them back to me. I start off with the mon modular monolithic one. We put that one in. Again, very nice fit. When we look at the x-ray, everything's passive right down onto those multi-unit abutments. When we go the fully monolithic, if when I put that in and she just sat there at the mirror, just looking and looking and looking, she was just so excited about it as most of our patients tend to be with these things. Again, very nice fit, very nice adaptation everywhere. Passive fit when we see it going down onto the multis. And this, I think, you know, if I could summarize anything of this up is it's in this particular slide right here. This was the bite, okay? Everything went in passive. And if you noticed her bite originally, she wasn't even hitting on the left-hand side. She really wanted to do that. And all I had to do was just that number three and that number five. I just hit that real quickly in about 10 seconds with, with a burr, get those in. And then she just goes, oh my gosh, I'm hitting perfectly on both sides. This feels great. And again, all this was done in a digital pathway, no model work, just the scan visit, and then here's the delivery visit with her. So I hope you can see that we can truly think differently about these things and do them in a very different fashion by using our prime scan, using the Atlantis bridge base, using our new scan bodies. And it allows us to do things that, you know, we never thought we could do just a few years ago. So thank you guys very much. Very excited to spend the time with you. If you have any questions at all, feel free to email me.